in this video, we're going to talk about absolute dating. Okay, so in the previous video, we talked about relative dating, right? This also falls under the same learning competency, which is to describe the different methods of determining the age of stratified rocks. Let's go. It's gonna be so bad. With the discovery of radioactivity in the late 1800s, scientists were able to measure the absolute age or the exact age of some rocks in years. Now, we have three methods in absolute dating. We have the radiocarbon dating, potassium argon dating, and uranium lead dating. So this figure shows the difference between relative dating and absolute dating. In relative dating, basically, you will just know which is the youngest and which is the oldest. Okay? In absolute dating, you will know the exact age or what we call the absolute age. Now, this table just compares the two. Radiocarbon dating is used to find the age of once living materials between 100 and 50,000 years old. It is usually used to determine ages of human fossils and habitation sites. Now, you will see a video which explains carbon-14 dating. Suppose you've discovered an ancient bone amulet in an archaeological dig, and you want to know its age. You can use the rate of decay of carbon-14 to determine the artifact's age. The nucleus of a carbon-14 atom is unstable. At some time, this unstable nucleus will emit a high-energy electron called a beta particle, which has a 1 minus charge. The beta particle causes a neutron to change to a proton, and the carbon-14 atom then decays into a nitrogen-14 atom. The average time for half of a group of carbon-14 atoms to decay is 5,730 years and is called a half-life. Your bone amulet is found to contain only 12.4% of carbon-14. How old is the artifact? The level of 12.4% indicates that three half-lives have passed. Three half-lives times 5,730 years is 17,190 years old. Carbon-14 samples can be accurately dated up to 60,000 years old. Oh my God! Wow! Next, we have potassium-argon dating. Potassium is common in many minerals such as feldspar, mica, and amphiboli. With its half-life, the technique is used to date rocks from 1,000 years to over a billion years old. Potassium-40 decays to argon-40 with a half-life of 1.26 billion years. Okay, so this is the symbol of half-life. This figure shows how potassium-40 becomes argon-40. Now remember, argon is a gas, allowing it to escape from molten magma. Thus, any argon that is found in an igneous crystal probably formed as a result of the decay of potassium-40. Now, measuring the ratio of potassium-40 to argon-40 yields a good estimate of the age of that crystal. My God! Yo! Next, we have the uranium-lead dating. Two uranium isotopes are used for radiometric dating. Uranium-238 decays to lead-206 with a half-life of 4.47 billion years. Uranium-235 decays to form lead-207 with a half-life of 704 million years. Now remember, uranium-lead dating is usually performed on zircon crystals, like this. When zircon forms in an igneous rock, the rock crystals readily accept atoms of uranium but rejects atoms of lead. Now, if any lead is found in a zircon crystal, it can be assumed that it was produced from the decay of uranium. Oh my god, a vibe, an attitude, a lifestyle, bye. This figure is a 4.4 billion year old zircon crystal fragment and this is believed to be the oldest piece of earth ever found. I said what I said. 
To determine the age of the zircon fragment, the scientists first use a widely accepted dating technique based on determining the radioactive decay of uranium to lead in a mineral sample. But because this technique might give a false date due to possible movement of lead atoms within the crystal, the researchers turned to a second sophisticated method to verify the finding. They used a technique known as atom probe tomography. Because of the atom probe tomography, it is possible to identify individual atoms of lead in the crystal and determine their mass. And it was confirmed that the zircon was indeed 4.4 billion years old. To put that age in perspective, the Earth itself formed 4.5 billion years ago as a ball of molten rock, meaning that its crust formed relatively soon thereafter, like 100 million years after. The age of the crystal also means that the crust appeared just 160 million years after the very formation of the solar system. This suggests that the early Earth was not as harsh as a place as many scientists have thought. This dating verified and strengthened the theory that the Earth actually had liquid water by 4.3 billion years ago. And perhaps Earth was capable of sustaining microbial life. Now, we have said that the oldest fossil record of life are stromatolites, right? produced by an archaic form of bacteria from about 3.4 billion years ago. Now the question is, when did the Earth first become habitable for life? I'll leave this to you to answer. Now let's have an activity. You have to list down the sequence of events from oldest to youngest in this picture. Then you have to write down the principles in stratigraphy that you used. Okay, I'll give you five minutes to accomplish this task. Ready? No! 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 Go. Okay, so let's start from oldest to youngest. First is the formation of slate, followed by formation of sandstone. Next, intrusion of granite. Fourth is the formation of limestone. Fifth is the intrusion of basaltic dike. Sixth is the erosion or unconformity. Seventh is the deposition of volcanic ash. Eighth is the deposition of shale and siltstone. Ninth is the intrusion of pegmatite dike. However, the pegmatite dike may also have occurred after together with the intrusion of basaltic dike or together with the deposition of the limestone. And if you remember, we have studied this in the previous video, relative dating. I do not. I've heard of it though. <laughs> so if you remember those, you can answer the principles in stratigraphy used. All in all, absolute dating of these rocks will solve the problem. I'm gonna go for now. Uh, I guess.